Hello, everybody, and we're live. Sorry, I'm a little late. I had to uh, take care of something pretty quick, but I got it done. Please do more on DB Cooper. Hey, Randy, I like uh, saw your comment earlier about this case. I thought it was interesting. I'm gonna I'll go back to it on the live chat. Yeah, we'll do more DB Cooper. Shoot, Ryan and uh, Ryan would do DB Cooper all day long, and we, and Ryan and I can talk DB Cooper all day long. So um, might do like a weekly DB Cooper thing. Is since Ryan does that 100% of the time, he's always got some new stuff. So we'll probably do that. Thanks, Patty. Of course, this uh, my slide up here was made for the for the main thumbnail for YouTube for this video we're gonna do. So this got screwed up. It looks okay for the reason I the main reason I did it was for the thumbnail, but it got screwed up here when I used it as a as a slide, but. That's the reason that's all screwed up. So is a, uh, how does the mic sound? Just making sure, because I remember I did an entire interview one time with the microphone unplugged. Only I would pull that off. Insane. I saw Tony Doug Wright earlier. Hey, Tony. And I appreciate the comment about the, uh, the Yuba County 5 video we did. That's doing really well. We enjoyed doing it. And it was great to have the family members join us. I wasn't even going to do a green screen tonight, but when I got into StreamYard, it was already there. And I just happened to have a, a, a picture saved already of this case, which is obviously the disappearance of Brian Schaefer. So uh, thanks, Bob Group. Thanks for showing up. Hey, Tyler. Thanks, Tony. So anyway... We'll get to the heart of the matter. I'll probably leave. I'm going to leave this slide up for a while, even though it's screwed up, but it's still got some good pictures on it. So I did a video not too long ago. I don't even maybe five or six months ago on this case. Of course, it's the disappearance of Brian Schaefer. And uh, the video turned out pretty well, but I wanted to go over it again. Somebody reminded me about this case yesterday. And, I'm, you know, I haven't thought about it in a while because uh, I think Pat Brown covered it on her YouTube channel. And that's a really good channel. And it just got me thinking about this case again because it's definitely one of the most fascinating. It's 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 got a lot of things in common with Yuba County Five. Uh, it's obviously one person going missing, but it's got so many weird avenues you can go down. And like Yuba County Five, as soon as you think you got uh, one of the theories figured out, it falls apart. I mean, it's it definitely has that in common with the Yuba County Five, even though this is a a single guy that went missing. Uh, it's Brian Schaefer, obviously he said his name. I know most people have heard of this case, but he disappeared on April 1st, 2006 is when this happened. He has still not been located. It's uh, a baffling mystery. He went missing from a bar. We'll get into that. And, um, in Ohio and the guy's just never been found again. And this isn't like going missing in a national park where there's always a chance somebody just got lost or, uh, you know, got off the trail and just got further and further lost and, and wound up perishing somewhere and never found it's this guy went missing in a, in a, in an urban setting, which is not very normal. Hey, Chris. So I'm going to read this little intro to the case. It says Brian Schaefer was last seen between 1 30 AM and 2 AM on April 1st, 2006 at a bar called the ugly tuna saluna with his best friend, Clint Florence, as well as another friend after finishing up his midterms, for the semester. Brian was supposed to be leaving for vacation with his girlfriend in Miami for spring break on April 3rd. However, Brian Nadip never made it to the airport. After the investigation into his disappearance had begun, footage from the Ugly Tuna Saluna was recovered by police, showing Brian on an escalator going to the bar's main entrance at 1.15 a.m. and again at 1.55 a.m. outside the bar before moving back towards the entrance to the bar off camera. Brian was never seen on camera leaving the bar after that and we'll go over that it's a really big point of this case is they have video of what they believe are all the other patrons leaving the ugly tuna saluna that night and for a little more background on this case um brian schaefer was 27 years old at the time he went missing he was going to um ohio state university medical school he did his undergrad at ohio state and um he was studying to be a doctor he wanted to become a doctor doctor because his mom was in the medical field she wasn't a doctor but i don't she was some form of medical assistant or something like that 
And uh, I'm going to go over the timeline, but, uh, you know, he's from Ohio. Um, I spent his whole life there and winds up going to Ohio State, right? You know, he's from Pickering, Ohio, and he, so he's only like 10 minutes away from Ohio State. So, uh, again, Daddy went missing April 1st, 2006. Birthday was February 25th, 1979. Uh, I don't know what he held me today, but obviously he was 27 when he met, went missing. He was 6'2", uh, tall guy. He was about 160, 165 pounds. He had brown colored hair. And just before, like this, this is really what begins the timeline with this, this disappearance is uh, March 6, 2006, when Brian's mother passes away from cancer. She had a rare form of blood cancer, and Brian was really close to his mother. So he does wind up going missing fairly shortly after the death of his mom. And they, and people said for the most part, it looked like he was handling it pretty well. But when they had her funeral, Brian was uh, late to her funeral because he was having so much trouble coming to grips with the death of his mother that uh, he couldn't find it within himself to even go to her funeral. But he does finally make up his mind to go. And I think he's like an hour late. I think he basically missed it from what I understand, which is horrible. But yeah, just he was just that distraught. And uh, so he's studying for uh, his exams really hard. And uh, it, the, the classes are about to wind up for spring break at uh, Ohio State University. And so he goes to dinner with his father. I got the timeline here. March 31st, 2006, spring breaks begins. Classes at Ohio State University conclude for spring break. Brian has big plans for spring break, including a dinner with his father that evening and a vacation with his girlfriend the following week. His girlfriend is pictured here in the middle. That's his girlfriend, Alexis Wagner. She's remarried now, but uh, that might come up again later. But at the time, uh, that was his girlfriend. And uh, by most accounts, he was going to propose to her when they went on this trip to Miami that his mother bought for him. Uh, obviously, before she passed away, that was all arranged. And uh, supposedly, Brian had bought her an engagement ring, and that was – what was going to happen it was he was going to propose to alexis on this trip to miami so evening of march 31st 2006 brian and his father go out to uh outback steakhouse restaurant in columbus ohio obviously that's didn't mention that that's where uh ohio state is in um columbus ohio pretty pretty good sized city but not very big but but big enough so uh brian's father remembers that night that he, you know, he couldn't believe that Brian had plans to go out after they went to dinner. Cause Brian told him, Hey, I'm going to go meet up with my old buddy, Clint Florence and uh, another friend. And we're going to go, you know, blow off some steam because it's spring break. And, and his father's like, man, you know, you've been, you're like wiped out because, you know, he's still grieving over his mom passing away and been studying hard for his exams to, to, uh, in med school. So his father said, man, you're exhausted. Like, I can't believe you're going to do it, but that's what his plans were. So he's like, okay, I guess he's going to do what he's going to do. So I think it was sometime after dinner, Ryan called his girlfriend, Alexis Wagner, who was back home uh, after spring break. She went back home to visit her family in Toledo, Ohio. And uh, so she wasn't around him the, the night he disappears, which is going to be this night on March 31st, 2006. But during that phone call, Brian confirms uh, his plans with Alexis to travel to Miami for a vacation that following week. Uh, Alexis claimed that that conversation started as normal and that Brian didn't end the call saying that he loved her. So, you know, by all accounts he did. So it's around 9 30 PM that same evening. And Brian meets up with his friend Clint Florence at the ugly tuna saloon. So this is where he does wind up disappearing from at the ugly tuna, but that was also their staging area. They, they, started out at the ugly tuna they parked there there was a big uh, parking structure i think it's called uh, the gateway complex and i'm not uh, confusing that with the gateway projects from the ua case but it's called the gateway complex where this uh, bar was and it's on uh you know it's up this escalator you can just kind of see it behind me on the group okay. i'll pull up another one that's kind of what i have in the background there this is um kind of i'll pull this slide up now so you can kind of see this it's a second story bar the ugly tuna these are the escalators and they'll come into play some more but uh so they start out there and they have one shot their, their plan was to do like one shot of liquor at various bars throughout columbus and they started at the ugly tuna 
tuna did one shot and then they leave the ugly tuna it's brian with clint and they met up with another uh, friend of theirs named meredith and they went to several other bars and they did a shot and eventually they wind up coming back to the ugly tuna so it says clint states each of them had one shot of hard liquor at each bar so uh now it's after midnight so it's now it's april 1st and they meet up with uh, their friend meredith reed that i just mentioned and she's a friend of clint it says meredith gives Brian and Clint a ride back to the Ugly Tuna Saloon and joins them for the final round of drinks. So it's going to be, you know, they're wrapping it up. They're going to leave from the Ugly Tuna and just get one final round. So now it's 1.15 a.m. on April 1st. Brian, Clint, and Meredith are seen on closed circuit TV arriving at the Ugly Tuna. And there, this is the shot of those cameras right there that you're looking at is, is when they were seen on closed circuit. Now, you see this little uh, highlighted part over here on the right is uh that's brian brian was six two he's easy to pick up on the camera there and he's talking to another female and i think this could be the last time he seems because he, he comes into to view once and then he comes back into view but i think that's this might be the last frame that he was ever ever the last time he was ever seen and they believe he just goes back into the bar at this point so Again, 115, Brian Clinton Meredith are, uh, are seen at the Ugly Tuna Saloon. There's another shot somewhere that they actually show them coming up that escalator on the left. That was the one coming up, and the one on the right, or my right, is the one that, that goes down leaving the bar. It says the trio is seen riding an escalator up to the Ugly Tuna Saloon bar at 115 a.m. So the picture I'm showing now is, is one that's going to happen a little bit later, but the same cameras. Okay, uh, 155 a.m., Brian is seen for the last time on CCTV. So that is the shot that you're looking at now. This is the last time Brian is seen. That's him on the right. That's with that little glow around it. That's just done to, to highlight him. It's not a light. It says Brian is seen on security footage outside of the bar. Well, I mean, this is outside. I mean, this is covered, obviously, but the, the entrance to the bar is like below this. I like it's right behind it. Like the camera's mounted where you walk into the bar. I don't know if I have a shot of that. This is one, I mean, I'm gonna bring this up later. So this is the entrance to the bar on the right here. You see the ugly tuna saluna and that camera is somewhere up here looking back over those escalators. So Brian's seen on security footage outside of the bar talking to two unknown women. That was that other shot before saying goodbye. After this, Brian seems to move as if he was going back into the bar. Okay, it said on the escalator, but I think that's screwed up. Okay. Overnight, it says some, at some point, Clinton Meredith gets separated from Brian in the bar. They, and they think he went to go talk to the band. It says the three agree that they are ready to leave. And Brian tells Clint that he is going up to the stage area because there was a band playing that night. And we'll get to that. After this, Brian gets separated from the group. Clinton Meredith are unable to reach him via phone call at this point. 2 a.m. The Ugly Tuna Saloon, Ugly Tuna Saloon bar closes. Clinton Meredith exit the bar with the rest of the crowd and wait outside for Brian to exit. So they all go down those escalators again. And Clinton Meredith are waiting. I think right at the bottom of the escalators are a little bit more out. I'll put that. Let me put the escalators back up. So these they so they go down there. Everybody that that's the only way out of the bar, uh, other than one back exit that we'll get to that's never used. But um Clinton Meredith are down there. Uh, Brian is not seen on CCT footage leaving the bar. And that's a huge point of this case. And no one who had been at the bar that night reported seeing Brian exit the bar. There were only two entry slash exit points at the bar, the front, the main entrance, and a back service door, which is only used for bar employees. After waiting, the two assumed that Brian walked home. Okay, okay so we don't know if Brian walked home because he was never found again. So let me put this other picture back up. This is what I'm told was an, it was the only other way out at the time was this entrance to the construction site, which some believe Brian may have found that somehow and somehow stumbled out that construction exit. That's why he was never seen on the camera. So you see up here where the camera's mounted. Actually, that's actually the, what was pointed over the uh, escalator. So you could have walked out of the bar and somehow, if you if you were tight enough to that wall or so, even at his height, maybe gotten over there without the cameras picking you up. So is it possible that Brian went out that exit? I don't know. And I'm not sure that 
that's the interest of the construction site. But this one thing it was pretty sure about it, and they're the ones that labeled it. So that's one theory that may have happened to Brian. So uh, Brian, uh, Clint Meredith, they're still trying to call Brian. Uh, he never picks up the phone. Uh, they're trying all night. They just assume, okay, this guy, he was, he was drunk, obviously. He was drinking quite a bit that night. So they just think he somehow made it home, which was about, I think, a 15-minute walk. It says, uh, still that night, Alexis calls Randy, Brian's father, because now I think his, his uh, I think she finds out the next day, Alexis finds out the next day that Brian hasn't shown up. And then uh, she comes back from Toledo and they find out that Brian is not in his apartment and his car is not in the parking lot because I get it says Alexis stays at Brian's apartment over the weekend in case he comes home. Nothing has been disturbed at his home. So I think it took like it was a couple of days um, until they knew. They knew he was definitely missing by April 3rd because that's when they were supposed to fly to Miami. So he obviously I think at that point, Alexis thought, well, maybe he's just drunk, hung, hung over somewhere and he's just going to miraculously make it to the airport because he knew, knows this trip is booked. But that trip is booked for April 3rd and Brian misses the flight. So that's when they know something is wrong big time um they don't know where brian is so it's that same april 3rd uh two days later now that brian's officially reported missing it says after no one is able to get in contact with brian over the weekend randy his father's father's name is randy calls the columbus police department and reports his son is a missing person from here police investigated police investigation officially begins uh the next day on april 4th 2006 a seven thousand dollar reward is offered and then it says the following in the days following Brian's disappearance, Crime Stoppers offers a $2,000 reward along with an additional $5,000 reward being offered by Ohio State University College of Medicine and Public Health. So that's it. At this point, the search is on. Theories are kicking in. No one knows where he is. There's no there's no good leads. Everything's being uh, crazy investigated. Uh, they wind up, this is going to be a, a big point in this case is they wind up doing polygraph tests they one person that takes a polygraph test is brian's father randy who of course passes it meredith is given one and she passes it and i think another lady they met up with the bar that night um i think her name is brighton i think she also took one and passed and of course they're going to ask his his good friend clint florence and clint was obviously brian's close friend they used to be roommates uh they weren't roommates at the time that brian went missing Brian had his own apartment. He wasn't living with Clint at the time, but he had been roommates, I think, when they were undergrads, but they were going to med school together. So famously in this case, Clint um, refuses to be polygraphed under extreme pressure from Brian's family, including Brian's brother, Derek, and, uh, of course, Randy, his father. Other people involved with it are saying, hey, you know, you saw him last. You know him well. You went out with him a lot. Why won't you take this? Uh, polygraph just to clear yourself and uh, Clint winds up getting a lawyer who who you know he lawyers lawyers up quickly and says you know I'm not doing it I don't have to you can't make me kind of thing and famously also as uh, the weeks went on Clint started purportedly saying bad things about Brian I don't know what they were but he was talking negatively about Brian so that added fuel to the fire of maybe Clint being involved in Brian's disappearance so this is one of the top theories in the case. Did Clint Florence have anything to do with the disappearance of Brian Schaefer? And the answer is we don't know. I think he probably does know something, but I don't think he was directly responsible. And I think that's probably why he wouldn't take a polygraph because he didn't want whatever that smaller thing he knew to get out. And that could be a million things. Uh, maybe they were dealing with some shady guys and bought drugs from them because maybe they were doing cocaine to study, to stay up late, to, to absorb all that information. He passed med school. And, uh, you know, Clint had a really bright future. He was a really good student, went on to a big time job in research with infectious diseases, not just a straight up, you know, family doctor. I mean, he was, he does high level medical research to this day, a uh, big time job. He knew he had a huge career ahead of him. I think he was probably worried about something else coming out during that polygraph that, he thought would hurt his career and that's why he didn't even want to risk it or he might have also known that brian was um uh, cheating on alexis so that's that's another thing that could have happened here and that could have been why uh 
Clint was later heard saying some bad things about him. It was also said by Meredith at one point that she believed that she saw Clint and Brian arguing up at the bar at the Ugly Tuna, uh, you know, when, when they made it their last stop. that they, She saw them arguing, but it was loud in there. And there was a band that night, and she didn't really know what the uh, context of the argument was, but she did believe that they were fighting over something that night, but she never knew what it was. So that makes Clint a little more suspicious that they were fighting about something. So after Brian disappears that night, Clint goes back with Meredith. Uh, they were staying at a professor's house that night, but uh, there's lots of theories about maybe Clint leaves there that night and he goes over to Brian's apartment and kills him or something like that. I think that's highly unlikely, uh, but nothing's out of the question here. But I, I just, I lean against that. There's also another story that's, that's told a lot and it gets kind of screwed up that there was a, Brian and Clint went to a Ohio State football game one one day. And this is probably a year or so before the disappearance, and they were walking out from this this game, you know this football game, and they were drinking, of course, most of those guys do. And out of nowhere, somebody sucker punched Brian, and he didn't know who it was. And that's pretty crazy. Brian's six two; he could probably handle himself. And I, I think that after after he got hit, he was kind of you know staggered a little bit. And whoever did it got away, but. Meredith said at one point that she believes Clint set that up and that she had written that years ago. And I, mean, I don't think Meredith knew Clint that well, but she always believed that he had something to do with this person sucker punching Brian after the football game. So that's one of the stories out there that does have true origins in this case, which is kind of strange as far as Clint goes. I've also read where people that were in classes with, with Clint Florence said he had a real sick sense of humor uh, some stuff like that. That doesn't make him a killer or responsible for his friend's death, but there's lots of speculation to got about the guy. So most people like me, if I was in that situation and my friend went missing and it was going to offer that kind of relief to the family, I'm going to take the polygraph. I'm going to risk it, whatever, you know, like if something comes out, like we did drugs or bought cocaine for a test or whatever, I'm going to, I'm just going to, you know, I'm going to own up to it and say, Hey, you know, um, uh, we did it and it let it come out because I couldn't take the guilt of not giving this family that relief. Cause it's just horrible tragedy. This guy with his whole life ahead of him, just bafflingly disappears. So that opens up everything for all the crazy theories. Some people think that maybe Brian never got out of the bar cause he's never seen it on security footage. Maybe he got caught between a wall or something. And that famously happened before at a club in Canada, there was a DJ at the club and he was on some kind of really heavy drugs. I don't know if it was LSD or what, but something pretty heavy. And he winds up just kind of losing his mind. And he winds up wedging himself behind a wall somewhere. And he literally dies and no one knew about it for like months later because it started smelling. Uh, so there is a precedent for that happening. But I don't think that happened here. I don't think that Brian Schaefer is still... He was still in that bar. Now, the bar's long gone. That bar, uh, Ugly Tuna, actually relocated to another part of town. Uh, where it was at the time was an area that was being redeveloped in Columbus and, and the, the property values were skyrocketing literally. So uh, the landlord probably, I think uh, tried to make the rent so high for uh, the ugly tuna to renew their lease that they just said, Hey, we, we can't, we obviously can't pay that. So, and they knew they couldn't pay it. So they were just going to, they were just going to leave and not uh, take the renewal option. So they moved to another part of Columbus where they're still open today, but I don't, I don't know how far away it is. I've never been there, but um so later, the Ugly Tuna, Ugly Tuna Saluna becomes uh, part of Ohio State University. Uh, it's like uh, some corporate offices for Ohio State in that same complex. So I think by now, if he was in that building after the remodel of the offices for Ohio State, uh, whatever else they were doing on the first floor, they would have found his body by now. This guy's 6'2", okay? I don't think that Brian Schaefer is still um, – is still in there. Uh, was there ever any kind of evidence? No, there's, there's no evidence. There's, there's zero evidence. There's, there's less evidence in the Yuba County five of what happened to Brian. There's just, there's just, no one knows. That's why we're all we're left with is theories like, okay, Clint is like, we'll call Clint one of the theories. Another one, like I just mentioned, he somehow, is still in the building. That's why they never accounted for him on the video uh, footage leaving. I think that's probably impossible and highly unlikely. Okay, so what are the other theories? Uh, the other theories are that he makes it out of the building without being seen, 
by going through that exit, going through the um, that second exit over here, or it says entrance to a construction site. So there was construction being done at that facility at the gateway on the first floor. I don't know what was going in there, some kind of retail or whatever, but apparently this other exit um, took you down to where that construction was being done at the time. And then it would go out a door onto, onto a, onto a sidewalk to a road where you could have, could have gotten out. So there's also theories that maybe Brian somehow finds this exit drunk, of course, and he gets hurt down there somehow. And then he's uh, the workers show up the next day to work on this retail build out or whatever. And they, they saw that Brian got hurt or killed and they wanted to cover it up. So they weren't sued. And uh, I've seen people, I've seen people write lots about that theory. And I'm like, I think that theory has no legs at all. I mean, I think if they found the guy down there, they would have called the police and just said, Hey, that, you know, this was blocked off. Guy was obviously drunk. It's his fault. And just let it, let the chips go where they go. Uh, I don't think that that happened. I really don't. It's possible that Brian makes it out of that other, that other, that other way, but he really had no reason to, even if he was trying to ditch Clint and Meredith, which some people claim that he was, he just wanted to, to lose them for some reason. He was kind of flirting with that other girl. Brighton was her name. And apparently uh, he, Brian took her cell phone from her and programmed his phone number in her phone and gave it back to her. Uh, I think that was said. So even if he was trying to get rid of Clint and Meredith and then later go meet up with Brighton, why he doesn't have to go through all that. He doesn't have to look for a back, a back exit. He doesn't have to do any of that. He could have just told uh, Clinton Meredith, Hey, I'm going home. You know, I'm just going to, you know, or drop me off at my apartment. You guys go where you're going. And he could have gotten home and called her if, if that was his goal or whatever he wanted to do. So it just doesn't, none of the, it's like Yuba County five. None of these things really make a whole lot of sense. And I was thinking about it. Let me see Bible group. Maybe he put on a disguise in the restroom and slipped out down the elevator. I've, I've seen that brought up too, that he either could have put on a disguise uh, or he could have just bent down somehow being 6'2 and not seen on that footage leaving. Uh, you know, but why? Why Why would he want, why would he, I mean, if he was trying to dodge Clint and Meredith, they're not going to come up there and watch the video footage of where he went that night. They're just going to blow it off like they eventually did, you know, like, okay, he's just drunk. He just went home, right? Um I don't know why Brian himself would want to avoid being on video or why, you know, I could see him maybe wanting to sneak out where, where uh, Clinton Meredith don't see him, but why would he want to hide from the camera? You know, I, I, I just don't know. And I know they, they poured over that footage and it's pretty clear. And they claim they accounted for everybody at the bar um, on that footage that left, but I don't know how they would have known who all was at the bar. I mean, so it's not like you had to write your name on a list or something when you came into the bar. So I, I, I don't know how they state that, but they said they accounted for everyone there except for Brian Schaefer. So I don't really understand that, but Hey, that's a good point though, Bob. Maybe he's trying to avoid uh, those two and he, in doing so with not uh, wanting them to see him, he's available to evade the cameras because he's just trying to hide himself to dodge those two because he just doesn't want to deal with them for whatever reason because he was fighting with Clint. And then uh, and then the theory would be that he just – something bad happened to him on his walk home. There's a Wendy's restaurant right across the street from this bar. And it's actually the first Wendy's that was ever built. And it was still open at the time, obviously. And he may have gotten as far as the Wendy's. I think they had uh, tracking dogs or something. And I think they actually – uh, some of them went over to that parking lot of that Wendy. So maybe he make, makes it out that way. He's hiding himself. He doesn't get caught on camera and he makes it to the Wendy's and maybe he runs into somebody and he wants to go buy drugs or something. And he wasn't known to, to really do hard drugs. He drank and stuff like most of them, but no one ever knew him to be into hard drugs. So something, if that happened and that's a possibility, he gets picked up and taken away and, and, and murdered. So that's one of the possibilities. Another one that's huge in this case is that he just decided to leave his life. And, you know, he was a big Jimmy Buffett fan and he was a big Pearl Jam fan. Actually, uh, he had a Pearl Jam stick man tattoo, of course, famously. And they thought, you know, he'd often talk about, hey, I just want to leave it all and go play guitar on the beach like Jimmy Buffett, you know, Margaritaville and, and just hang out in some tropical place. And uh, I know there's a second cousin of his out there on a Facebook group that swears that, yeah, man, if you knew Brian or, or what I know about him, yeah, he's definitely the type that would just take off. 
You know, he would just not tell anybody. So, but a lot of people say, no, he wouldn't do that. He's going to leave his, his girlfriend that he was going to propose to supposedly he's going to do that to his father. Who's also grieving the loss of his wife. And he's going to do that to his younger brother, Derek. And he's not even going to leave a note like, Hey, I'm going to go find myself or something. He's just going to go. He's going to do it at the, after a night at the ugly tuna. He's going to just go leave his whole life. I don't know. I'm, I'm not really buying that. Bible group was Brian, a member of a secret society, AKA the Freemasons. I don't know. I don't know a whole lot of younger, younger guys that were ever Freemasons, but that comes up sometimes in this case, mainly because this hand signal that Brian's making here. Now here's a picture of Brian and his mom. And this is when he, uh, some kind of event or something at medical school. And I think he you know, either passed something or did something. It was some occasion here. So in the picture of his mother, you can see that. And I did a close up here. He's, he's doing this, um, this symbol with his hand, which is, I know that's, I love you or whatever in sign language, or it's the devil horns or heavy metal or whatever. I mean, he was mainly a Pearl Jam guy and Jimmy Buffett. I don't think he was like into any major heavy metal stuff. So I don't know what this means though. I don't know if it means I love you or some kind of secret society deal, but that's been, that's where you go down the rabbit hole is why is he doing that? And it's obviously important to him because he's doing it here in a, a picture of just him and his mom. Then here's a picture of just him and his dad. He's doing it. And um, then here's a picture of both of them with his mom and dad, all three of them. And he's still doing that. There is one other picture from this group where he's not doing it. It's just him by himself, but he's doing it three times in three different photographs, making that, that hand gesture. I don't know what it means, but it's heavily, heavily speculated. It means something to him, especially the one here with his father. Look at him. I mean, he's slouching down and doing that hand signal. You can tell right there that one with his daddy's right. Like, really? That means something to him. That's whatever it is. I don't know, but it means something to him. Randy says he ran into his drug dealer or loan shark at the bar and hid from paying up, just reaching for ideas. You know, Randy, that has been speculated in this case that he owned a loan shark money. Some people said that he did some loan sharks that were not in Columbus, but a little further out of the Columbus area that he owed money to. And this is just a rumor and there's no proof to it. And they came and got him. But the whole deal with the loan shark is if they kill him, they're not going to get any money. I mean, you think they would at least break a leg or whatever they would do back in the day, you know, but he'd have, I think the guy would have to be like extremely, in debt, like, you know, not, not even paying these guys anything or going to his dad or a friend or whatever to say, Hey, man, give me five grand or these dudes are seriously going to kill me. Um, but I don't know. That's kicked around a lot. And that could be something that, that Clint knew about and didn't want to say, that's why he didn't want to take a polygraph. Cause he was afraid he would have to give up these bad guys or the, or like loan sharks or drug dealers. And, uh, they'd come after him. Like maybe Clint was uh, buying drugs from these same guys and he knew that Brian owed him money or got an advance from him either on drugs or cash or whatever. And that's why Clinton like couldn't do it because they were like, if that came out, they'd come, they'd come get him. So that's a possibility. And it would absolutely explain why Clint has never taken the polygraph because he didn't want to give up these guys if he thought that they were capable of doing away with Brian. So my personal could be Illuminati. My personal belief is, and I'm, you know, this is just one theory of many, and I'm not, you know, hard and fast on it. Was I think Brian ran into somebody at the Ugly Tuna Saluna while drunk that somehow got him out of that bar without being detected by the cameras. Like, I just think that's a big piece of this. The fact that he wasn't caught on the cameras, and it seems like everybody else was, is is a big piece of why he went missing. It's that one event, missing the cameras and then never being seen again. I think those two have to be tied together. So I think that he's in the bar, he's drunk, he runs into somebody that, that that knows how to get out of that bar undetected by the cameras because they probably are already thinking that they're going to do Brian harm wherever they get him. I think this is foul play. Uh, I don't have a whole lot to base it on. I'm just trying to use Occam's razor in explaining how he's not caught on camera and and never shows up again. I think somebody he ran into at the bar uh, you know, he probably got him talking enough. He's drunk and maybe under the guise of, Hey, we're going to go here and do this or that and gets him out of the bar, takes him somewhere and foul plays involved. And he's thrown 
in a river or something never to be found again. I think that's probably what happened. I just something like that. I don't think he ran off to start a new life. I don't think that uh, Clint killed him. I don't think he made it home somehow miraculously. And then Clint decides to go over there and kill him for, for some, you know, Clint had a huge, huge career ahead of him. Why is he going to risk that against Brian? Even if Clint was kind of weird and, and had something to do with him being sucker punched, why would he throw it all away? For that, I, I I don't know, but that's just where I'm at. I just think, I think that he runs into somebody there at the bar, and they know how to get around it. I don't know if that's someone connected to the band or not. So I thought I had a picture of the band. I guess I didn't put it up, but the band was playing that night, and um, that's supposedly that's the last thing Brian told his friends he was going to go do. He was going to go talk to the guys in the band because Brian was into music, he played guitar, he was in a band in high school. And uh, actually, the guys that do the podcast, True Crime Garage, it's based out of Columbus, Ohio, where this happened. So it's kind of their, it's literally in their backyard, this case. And they knew the guitar player from the band that played that night. And they played like an 80s, you know, they played like 80s hair metal and stuff like that. And uh, I don't think the band, I don't know if the band was ever even interviewed by police, but it's people like that that would have known how to either get out of there or taking the equipment out or somebody that worked at that bar. And I think they somehow got Brian to leave on his own without being detected by the cameras, maybe helping him out enough, just, you know, under his own power, but he's drunk. And wherever they go, some kind of foul play happens. And, and then that's it. That's just, that's where I'm at on this. I mean, I could change that tomorrow, but it, it's, uh, that's my main theory right now with this. So here's another picture talking about the hand deal. And no one's ever seen this one before. I found this one a while back. And this is where Brian took a trip to Puerto Rico. This one here on the right. I wish I could have zoomed in on this. But he's doing something with his left hand. It's not the same as that symbol he's making with the one with his parents. But his his index finger is is, is going straight up like this. Uh, it's upside down. You know, you could tell on his left hand. You know, he's got that beer cup on his right. But he's doing this weird thing with his index finger. And it does. I, I can't really tell why. I mean, it could just be. The, you know, he was just kind of doing something weird when they snapped this photo, but it, it's kind of reminiscent to me of him making those those hand gestures and those pictures with his parents. I don't know if it means any anything. I saw a guy uh, say one time that people are taking antipsychotic medication could do weird things with their hands like that. I, I've never heard that before. I don't know if it's true. I'm just throwing it out there. Just, just uh, a guy said that Uncle Jim looks like the devil horns could be. And. I go back to his cousin knew something. I mean, this isn't the second cousin that's on a Facebook group that said he just went away and started a new life because I don't even think that guy knew him. But a cousin that knew him really well, his name is uh, Dan Schaefer, obviously from his dad's side, uh, first cousin, said that he knew some kind of something about Brian that was kind of dark. I think he just described as kind of something either he was into or something that he just said was kind of dark. And I don't know what it is. I could never find out. I tried contacting this guy because I don't know. I'd love to know what it is. It might not have anything to do with Brian disappearing, but his cousin, Dan Schaefer, said there was some kind of weird secret about him or whatever. I don't know. The guy could have been just looking for some media. I don't know. But I always wanted to know what uh, his cousin Dan knows. Chris said he couldn't have fallen into water and not turn up he had to have been abducted yeah i think he was abducted i mean probably not in plain sight like if he just left the bar drunk and he let's just say he's drunk and he manages to get out that back door onto the street then someone's just gonna abduct him you know he's not like some small female that obviously predators are looking at rapists and stuff he's a six foot two guy i mean if anything he would have just been mugged or robbed i mean this has got to be somebody that really has it out for him. And, and then that goes to another thing I heard, because for a while I was going to write a book about this. And I talked to a lady who runs the, uh, the missing in Ohio website. I think that's what she goes by. And she was deep, deep into that case. This case, she's very good friends with Brian's father, Randy. Of course, most people know that follow this case. Randy got killed in a freak accident. I think two years after Brian went missing, he was in his backyard and this huge windstorm came up and it, blew this this huge tree causing a branch to break off of the tree and it fell and killed randy it's just another horrible tragedy so now you have brian's mom dying of cancer at a pretty young age 
Then you have Brian going missing just three weeks, you know, three weeks after her death. And then just two years later, Brian's father gets killed in a freak accident. I mean, I can't imagine everything that um, Brian's younger brother, Derek, went through. I mean, dealing with all three, I mean, his entire family's wiped out within the span of two years under, you know, just random stuff. I mean, they knew his mom had cancer, but I think there was some hope, but, you know, she passes away. Brian goes missing. Dad's killed with a tree limb falling off a tree. I mean, this, this is, this is horrific. Uh, I can't believe it. But anyway, this lady knew Brian's father really well and knew the case really well. And she told me that Brian used to work at a JC Penney's. I think it was in uh, Pickering where he was from, which is just a, a you know suburb of um, Columbus, Ohio. And I think he's, he might've started in senior year of high school and he was still working there into his undergrad in college, which of course was Ohio state, but he was working with this lady who was engaged to another guy. And Brian started a uh, intimate relationship with his coworker. And when her fiance found out about this intimate relationship with that she was having with Brian, he freaked out. And this is, she knows the people involved and told me this and said, this guy was, I mean, anybody's going to get mad at something like that. And the first person he should blame was his fiance. Cause you know, obviously she consented to this relationship with Brian, but she said this guy was like steaming pissed. I mean, like wouldn't get over it pissed. And I think from what I know about Brian, he had the tendency to, when he's out drinking, you know, he's a you know, nice looking guy, six, two, um, may have done something with somebody else's girlfriend. It might've been the one from the, the, the lady from JC Penny, or it could have been anybody else. And that could have been the reason Clint was mad at him because he was flirting with, um, Brighton that night. We don't know, but you know, maybe he runs into this guy that it was the fiance, the lady from JC Penny. I think the couple did wind up going ahead and getting married if I recall, but she told me that, yeah, that story comes out a lot. And this dude was pissed. I mean, like more than anybody could imagine pissed. So, you know, could have just been a guy like that. He runs into a guy like that. The guy happens to be at the bar, knows who Brian is. Maybe Brian didn't know the fiance that well. And the guy gets him out of the bar somewhere and just exacts his revenge. I don't know. I mean, anything is possible in this case. So here, this is the construction exit. That's what if, if Brian went out that way, he would have he would have come out these two doors right here. You know, you can tell it's dark in there, even like during the day. This is all that picture's taken from the outside during the day. You can see all the crap in there. You know, there's a construction going on in there. So uh I can't imagine at night, you know, like where it's dark outside, even if there's lights on the on the sidewalk or whatever, it's gonna be really dark. Like, how's a drunk guy even gonna find that and get out? Like, I that's just I I just don't see him doing that. I just I think somebody got him out of the bar coming out of these, these doors here and, and evading the camera and maybe walking him out here like somebody that wasn't so bad off and, and, and knows the other back way out of that bar. Um, who knows? Let me catch up with the comments. Hey, Anthony, this is a bizarre case, though likely with a somewhat mundane expl explanation. Could be, but what what would it be? I mean, this... That's this is gonna be a tough one. How would you even apply Occam's razor to this? I mean, a six foot two guy goes missing at a bar. I mean, I think the most mundane would be the camera just misses him and he's killed. I mean, because if it, if if he let's just say he makes it out and the cameras don't catch him, just for whatever reason, he's ducking down, just some anomaly, like a little clip in the footage, and he, they just don't catch him. He he's just the one out of a few that didn't get caught leaving on, on the CCTV footage, something prevents him from get from, from making it home something. So even if you can explain not getting caught on camera, what happened to this guy, uh, somebody had to have taken him elsewhere and done away with him one way or the other. I mean, where he can't contact his family ever again. I just don't think it was to start another life. Although that does happen. It does happen. I have seen cases where people just leave their lives. I mean, sometimes it'll be a woman that has kids that are around 10, 11, 12, or early teens and married, and she just disappears one day and they find her. You know, she leaves like Indiana one year and they find her 10 years later in South Carolina or someone sees them on TV. And then I've seen a few of these shows on YouTube where they catch up with them and they're like, 
yeah, you're right. It was me. And, you know, hey, do you want to go reunite with your family? And they always say no. I mean, for whatever reason, they just leave. So I don't know. Maybe he did. I mean, I'm not going to rule that out either. Could be Wendy's needed more beef. Yeah, where's the beef? No, I've never looked into the order. The order, the nine angels. They believe certain people deserve to be cold because they are natural victims. I, I, now you're scaring me. <laughs> I'm going to check it out. No way he ran away, but usually they found find drowned victims. Yes, Chris, they do. And people also kicked around the smiley face killer for this case because there was some other really weird disappearances around Columbus during that time. I can't remember all their names. I mentioned a few of them in the other video I did about Brian Schaefer, but there were some that, that, that looked like you know, smiley face killer where they find their bodies near water and then somebody's drawn a smiley face by it. And uh, usually they find those guys, though, the smiley face ones, they'll find their bodies in the water and uh, they don't know how they got there, but they're usually in that that age range. And Brian is in that age range that I talk about a lot of the, these guys that go missing. They are always somewhere in this 22 to 27 or 28 age range. Like, God, you name it. Uh, Daniel Robinson, the... Uh, the geologist that went missing. And I'm going to cover that. I probably have his father on pretty soon. To talk about his case. He's never been found. Um, Jason Landry, same college age uh, uh, student male just goes missing. They all that. That's the sweet spot for these guys that go missing. Uh, and of course the guys I'm talking about now have never been found. Um, Terrence Woods. I think he, Terrence was 25. I mean, all these guys are like 22 up to 27, 28. Uh, they, they're either, you know, in college or just, just out of college and they go missing and never found. I don't know. That's just the sweet spot for these agents on these guys. And uh, don't know why. Don't know who's targeting or what, but I don't know what could be too mundane about Brian Schaefer. I mean, this guy, I, something happened to him. Something happened to him. And I don't think he went off on his own volition, but it's I, you can't rule it out, though, unfortunately, because if there's one case that's ever happened, then there could be two. Yeah, that's what I'm leaning, Chris. I can't prove it. It's all speculation, and I wouldn't I wouldn't bet money on it, but somebody with a grudge. I just think somebody with a grudge. And uh was that was that Clint? Uh I don't know. I mean, I just don't know. It's, it's strange that Clint would not take the polygraph. We always go back to Clint. Why would he not do that? Knowing, I mean, Brian's younger brother literally begged him, like, man, dude, help us out. Like, we are suffering as a family here. And, and uh, Derek Schaefer knew Clint pretty well. They had gone out a few times and Brian became closer to Derek, you know, when, the, when their mom got sick with cancer, you know, they weren't that close growing up, but when their mom got sick, they kind of really bonded. So uh, Derek had gone out with, with just the three of them a few times. So he knew Clint fairly well and he was begging him like, dude, man, help us out. You know, we're suffering. Our mom just died. We don't know where my, you know, where our, my brother is. Uh, my dad is suffering. Why won't you just do this? You know, and a lot of people say that Clint was helping at first. He was going on searches and, um, you know, then Brian's dad started putting the pressure on him to, to go ahead and take the poly and then, and then alienated Clint from helping anymore. I mean, Brian's dad was dedicated to trying to figure out what happened to his son. I mean, he almost got killed dragging the water of one of these, um, the lakes that, that wasn't too far from the bar where they think Brian could have maybe just fell into and he got caught in it somehow. And he almost killed himself looking for his son's body down there. They had nothing to go on. Really. They were just generally doing a search and poor guy almost killed himself looking for his son. I mean, it's just terrific. Yes. Jen, you are my sister. Thanks. This is the first time I've seen you in the chat. It's my first time my sister's been in the chat. Well, maybe you've been in before. And I just I just missed you. We always locked up job sites. No way they left it unlocked or unattended. I agree, Jim. I I uh I'm a commercial property manager. I've got a lot of job sites. I've done a lot of retail build out. Um, I've never left a site unattended, never been in a lawsuit. You lock that stuff up. Anything that's obvious you can get hurt on, you take care of. 
you just you just i mean the liability is so high you just you just don't even do it hey Eduardo. Do you know what time he was standing outside the bar with the two women? I think that was right before closing. It was like, I think it was 1.55 a.m. Because there's that shot. There's Brian right there, and there's the two women. I, I know, I believe one of those is Brighton, who later became an attorney. But I think, I'm almost sure that was 1.55. So they think he went back in. So... Maybe he was going after one more drink. I don't know. I think before then, he'd already said he was going to go uh, talk to the band. That's what he told Clint and Meredith. And then he's seen with these other two at 1.55 a.m. And then after this this shot, he gets – he uh, you can't see him again. He doesn't go towards the escalators. Obviously, if he did, he'd be leaving, and he was never seen leaving. So he comes off of that camera shot back into the bar, and he's never seen coming out this way again. Yeah, I've seen that, Uncle Jim. There's a great YouTube channel where they solve cases, diving in rivers and lakes where cars go off the road. They find a lot of people that way. They just found one guy, uh, one young man, a couple of weeks ago that had driven into a uh, into a lake. I think it was in Alabama. I think it it was uh, somewhere in Alabama was the last time. That Randy said on the news today, a woman was found after missing 30 years in Puerto Rico. She suffered from dementia. Yeah, this hey, that's that's a theory too. Maybe Brian just was so stressed out after what after uh his mom passing away and studying, he just he just and drinking. Maybe he just lost it, but it's just an anomaly, maybe that he didn't get caught on uh film leaving the bar. If you're bombed, you can be easily overpowered. That's true. Where's the body in a trash dump underground, chopped up? Could be. Unfortunately, they never found it. Maybe he ran off to UT at Austin. I don't know what you mean by that. Does she think you mean Braden? My sister knows who DB Cooper was. And yes, it's Ted Braden. Anthony said, I worked in security for a large company that everyone has heard of. I could tell you that video cameras work, work, or I think they work far less than you would expect. I 100% agree with that. I'm dealing with that right now. Um, where my office is, we manage the whole complex that, that our company owns. It's four buildings, and we pay ADT like 6000 a month for rented camera equipment. And it's either never working when you need it or it's just uh, impossible to actually pull up usable footage yes the cameras aren't worth it if, if, if actually i'm trying to look to get out of our contract with adt because it's just an absolute ripoff so yeah that's true i think he could have just gotten past the even if he does get past the cameras though i'd still it's just baffling what happened to this guy Oh, uh, that, that, yeah, I've heard of this guy. Igor Sosky uh, has been an interesting explanation of why the smiley face victims are college, college age men. It's all about the psych impact on the community of students. Hmm, that's weird. You think that, that would, that would, I got to look that up. I wonder why that would be like have a more impact than females. I think females are, are, are would be worse. Anthony, I have no idea about the ones in this case. And it sounds like they were working this case, but it is, possible that he left alone or the others and the camera and the camera by coincidence malfunctioned for a second yeah that's that's possible absolutely you could have just malfunctioned it could have been just two random events happened one not getting caught on film two never making it home for whatever reason he just doesn't make it home yes i agree Ch chance that clint knows something that he's not saying since he's refusing to take the polygraph I can't imagine the pressure on that guy to take that, that he's got a younger brother who lost his mother and now his brother's missing and presumed probably, you know, probably presumed dead begging you to do it and you don't do it. Ah, that's, that's, that's a hard one. 
Thanks, Anthony. I enjoy your videos too. Anthony does a lot of good DB Cooper stuff. You guys should go check out Anthony's channel. If you click on that, you can, it'll probably lead you to Anthony, the Anthony R.R. Mill show and subscribe. Anthony's got good stuff. I subscribe to him and catch all his stuff and movie reviews and stuff are great. It's one thing I've never done yet. I've never reviewed movies, but if I did, it'd be old movies. It'd be old stuff. The only movie I've seen, I think the only movie I've seen in a year was Elvis. It's because my mom made me go, but it was good. Jen, did you see Elvis? You, I, surely you did. You didn't tell me if you did, though. If you came in town, we should have gone and seen Elvis together. We could have taken mom to go see Elvis. Yeah, Mark, if he knew someone in the band, he could have left with him through an alternate entrance. Yeah, because I don't think they would have hauled all that band equipment up, you know, down the escalator, they're gonna hold like the bass drum and stuff. I mean, they had to have had a way. I, they said the only other way out was a construction exit. And even people that worked there said that. So, but there had to have been a way to, you're not gonna, I mean, there had to be an elevator, like maybe further down here is an elevator. There has to be an elevator. Any kind of complex like this that has escalators, I managed something really similar to this. And it was uh, ironically called, um, it was called Gateway. <laughs> it was in Houston. There's a, there's a retail center called Gateway that I was actually involved with the construction and I managed it. And it had two escalators like this that were kind of, you know, pseudo outdoors, but it also had several elevators. So if there's two escalators going up somewhere, there's an elevator. It could be back over here. There's a movie theater in here too in this complex. So you know there's there's elevators. So I don't know if that's how uh I don't know if that, that's how the band would get their equipment up, but yeah, that that's they should have been the some of the first people that they talk to yeah there's a service elevator in every building and there's there's going to be civilian elevators too there's some people that just aren't going to use escalators and for someone like me that's managed multiple buildings with escalators you i mean they break more than security cameras their escalators are always breaking i mean for for nothing like somebody gets something caught under the tread they cost a fortune to work on um you know a nice center like this they probably do right even with regular maintenance, just random stuff. I mean, it's so hard to keep escalators constantly, constantly moving, you know. But absolutely, they're gonna have uh they're gonna absolutely have uh elevators. No problem, man. I don't do too many shorts. I need to. My daughter did one of uh her uh doing her reenactment of the DB Cooper heist, which I need to put back on. Yeah, I don't think they do get monetized like regular videos. But yeah, they can rack up a hundred. Yeah, they can rack up a lot of views. I don't know. Do you have. Where is Elvis? Elvis is there everywhere. Oh, you and Eric took. Oh, you and Eric took uh, Eric's mom. That's cool. I'm assuming she liked it. I like the Vegas part the best. I mean, the first part of the movie, I mean, it was just so much. If, if people are prone to migraines, don't ever go see the Elvis movie. I can't imagine if somebody like lights and um, and stuff like that, like the weird flickering lights is what they can trigger your migraines. Don't go, go see this movie because it's constant music and lights and flashing and you know, and you think you'd see more of that on the Vegas part of the Elvis movie when he, you know, does the older Elvis versus the younger, but it's the younger part where it's all this constant flashing and lights and flashbacking and man, it's, it's a, uh, I don't know how my mom, I don't know how I survived it, but it's a good movie. Don't get me wrong. It's really good. Really good. And he said, dude, a woman found missing after 30 years. Yeah, just making sure I didn't miss anything. Yeah, I missed this one, Tyler. Seems like the only variable here is the construction site and the door leading to it, the door off camera. How well did they look at that in the days after? I'm pretty sure they did. I know the cops looked at it really uh they like that looked at it really close. I remember the head officer on it, his name, I can't remember his first name, but his last name is Hurst. 
which is my middle name, Lost Battalion. That is a great movie. Man, the Lost Battalion is the best World War I movie ever made. And it was made for TV. I know Red Badge of Courage was just, no, what's the one they just remade on Netflix? The World War I movie. I guarantee you it's not half as good as, as The Lost Battalion. That's just a great story. It's a great movie. Ricky Schroeder, right? Was the timestamp on the video check with actual time? I don't know. If, if a few minutes off and they cut power when the bar closed, maybe time where he could have left without being seen. Yeah, that's another anomaly which could have easily happened. Smiley face killers should be a topic. Yeah, I, uh, I think somebody wrote a book about smiley face killers because I was checking to see if anyone ever covered that because I was thinking about doing it. I'm sure there's uh, been before, but still fascinating. Yeah, I think, you know, with smiley face killers, one of the most interesting one happened in Pittsburgh where I think they were trying to catch this guy. And he was in that same age range I talked about. And he was going to meet up with a, with a friend who was a female. And he told her that this car had been following him really slow. And he, he thought they were, they were looking to abduct him. And not long after that, another kid was found by a bridge, by a, a body of water near a bridge. And the, the smiley face was on it, but it was interesting. This guy's story about, being you know slowly you know, followed by this other car yes i remember that that was a good what song i know i did i think i sang little sister and what others i can't remember i think i did three songs that i had the karaoke for when i did elvis at my niece's birthday party yeah it's a it's a remake Oh, it was Ramsey, the guy that has the podcast. He's the same one. William Ramsey investigates. Yeah, I was in Pittsburgh. You know, the same place where the DB Cooper tie comes from. That, that I do agree with those guys on that tie. Anthony, if you're listening, one thing I agree about with that tie. It was in the Pittsburgh area. I don't think it was at Rim Crew, but I think it was in Pittsburgh. Because there was another character running around Pittsburgh quite a bit that probably stole it. Maybe a guy that worked for Pittsburgh Plate Glass and PPG. PPG had some... <laughs> PPG had a few metals going around there. Titanium, no problem. PPG back in Pittsburgh and the... Late 60s, early 70s, and metal known to man would have been found around PPG. Who knows what my favorite movie is? So you can't see it. My favorite movie was filmed in Houston, Texas. Oddly enough. No, I'm going to check that out for sure. Hey, Scott. Yeah, it's the one where the guy disappears out of the mall, even while all interests were supposedly covered. Yeah, they were supposedly covered by the cameras, but one wasn't. So there's some speculation. Some speculation that he may have gone out the one that wasn't covered, which was... uh. Not anymore, Patty. Not as much. Now, now I'll have gray hair. It's mostly gray. There's a picture of Franco Harris at the airport. Never been to Pittsburgh. I'd like to go. No, Ulysses isn't a big fan. Ulysses isn't a big Braden fan. He says he's too short. He says he... This Ulysses says that Ted Braden's too short at 5'8", even though uh, Bill Mitchell said Cooper was 5'9 to 5'10", but... Um, but this is okay for Ulysses, who now has a suspect at 6'2", and has piercing blue eyes, and who's missing half of his pinky on his right hand. So uh, I'm not gonna, I'm not too upset if that Eric, if Eric thinks that Ted Braden's too short to be DB Cooper, because as far as DB Cooper goes, I'm gonna go with what Billy Waugh thinks. Billy Waugh, who uh, 
had Osama bin Laden in a rifle scope and was uh, asking, can I take him out? Can I take him out? Nope. Stand down. Stand down. Can I take him now? Stand down. Billy Wall, who uh, told me personally that he could have literally thrown a rock and killed Osama bin Laden. That's how close he was to him. I'm going to go with who he thinks D.B. Cooper is all day long. I even told Billy, well, hey, Billy, some people think Ted's a little too short. And he laughed at me. He literally laughed. Like, you don't know anything about us, do you? I know a little bit, Billy, but not as much as you. But I'm going to go with Billy Wall. Special Forces legend in 30 years as a CIA contractor at the top levels. Hunt, hunting uh, Carlos the Jackal in Tora Bora at age 74 with a full automatic rifle on his back. Billy is a legend. And Billy... Thinks it's Ted. But yeah, I do agree with the Pittsburgh, Pittsburgh angle. And Braden was all over Pittsburgh. His third, his third wife is from Pittsburgh, who he married before the heist. And no, his wife doesn't know where he was that night. His, his wife also, his third wife also believed uh, that he was Cooper. It's another thing Braden goes, got, has going for him. I know eight people personally who knew Ted Braden personally who believe he's D.B. Cooper. If anybody can match that on a suspect, let me know. No, I agree. I, I'm going to dig into Clint more. Well, that's all I have. I just wanted to go over this case again because somebody had me, uh, had me thinking about it. Yes, bet the house on Billy. Man, Billy, if you know, or people that are following with Billy, Billy's 93 years old. His birthday was on December 1st, turned 93. He had uh, two he had two strokes. Two strokes. Um, and uh, he was in hospice. And this was just like five or six weeks ago. He was in hospice. Like he was preparing for death in hospice. And he, now he's going to probably get out of hospice. I mean, he be, beat it again. 93 years old. The guy is tough as nails. And it look, he looks like he might recover for another... I don't know how long, but the fact he's still alive after all the the medical setbacks were so bad, he was in hospice, and now he's in like a longer term place out of hospice. So Billy is a badass. I think Cooper did survive, Anthony. I, I know you don't, but uh, you know, I just don't. I don't think Cooper survived just because I think it's Braden, and I do because uh, it's it's a very survivable jump. It really is. I mean. All those paratroopers in World War II, I mean, the survival rates are high. Uh, you know, go, if he went into the water, I agree. If he goes into the water, he probably doesn't make it. Even Braden, I don't know if he could have made it. Well, actually, Braden probably could have made it out of the water. He was that tough. But uh, he was one of the uh, maniacs that probably could have survived somehow. He's just that insane. It's kind of like Gary Mathias was. But uh, the water was, it, it's, it's, in terms of the land he's over, pretty small, you know. And if it's Braden, I'm telling you, Braden could steer an NB-8, no problem. He could steer that military rig. You could, I mean, listen, Cossie all day long doesn't know what he's – Braden could have steered that rig. Al Tire said, oh, are you kidding me? We practiced on Navy bailout rigs. There was no sport skydiving back in the late 50s, early 60s when guys like Al Tire and Braden were with the Golden Arrows doing that stuff. I mean, he said, are you kidding me? We could steer, we could steer that rig wherever we wanted it. Like – no problem. If it's Braden, Braden doesn't go into the water. Number one, just doesn't do it. He's he's not going to do it. He's just too good. I don't passive glory. I don't know if I've seen that. I love Kubrick. Yep, Cooper survived all the copycats did, and one dropped and in, dropped into snow in Colorado. Yeah, they did. All the copycats made it. Heck, even. Uh, even Mac, Mac made it. Mac, I mean, Mac read a book about how to jump out of a 727, how to put on the rig, and then had the FBI guy show it, show him how to put the rig on. And Mac survived. Mac jumps out, totally inexperienced, out of a 727. And uh, of course, Mark McNally, who who uh, Ryan's gotten to know really well, uh, jumps out of 727 and survives. Pulls the ripcord, hits the ground hard. I mean, so hard that that he was seeing stars. And, and, and really out of it didn't break a bone i don't think at all and then he uh, wraps up in the parachute and goes to sleep in the, in the weeds for like i don't know 10 hours 
and then he gets out of there. I mean, he's eventually caught, unfortunately, but Mark McNally, total newbie novice, jumps out of a 727 at night and survives. I mean, yeah, the copycats, um, all, all the copycats did survive, every one of them. He could have closed, yeah, he could have jumped closer to uh to PDX rather than the center. Yeah, there's definitely no proof he, he jumped near there. Yeah, Mac is awesome. Mac is a character. I mean, Mac Max hijacking is far more far more entertaining than the DB Cooper all day long. I mean, the Cooper mystery is who he was, but as far as the events and how they played out, uh, you know, well, McCoy's interesting because McCoy was flying a helicopter looking for himself, of course, that famous story, but Mac is insane. I mean, that guy's crazy. I mean, he gets to the hotel. Uh, he's on the run. He's at the hotel and he goes, he gets on the elevator or wherever. I mean, it's swarming with FBI agents that are looking for him and he just plays it off. I mean, what a great story. Thanks, Chris. Yep. Brayden had the balls to do it. Yeah. Billy said he had balls to steal. Billy Wall. I mean, what can you imagine a compliment like that from Billy Wall? Billy Wall says you have balls of steel. Billy Wall invented balls. And he said Braden was in another league. And coming from Billy, like, Billy's got nine purple hearts. Thanks for coming by, Anthony. Yeah, I'm going to be logging off too, but uh, thanks for dropping by. Yeah, thanks, everybody. I'm um, going to wrap it up, but going to be doing something again soon. I know I'm going to have my friend Steve Stockton on really soon. Looking forward to that. It's going to be really good. Let me read Scott's real quick. Not a big fan of so-called missing 411 paradigm, but Politis is one of the few people talking about people going missing on college campuses. Yeah, like Schaefer. Yeah, a lot of them are either college campuses or college uh, students, either in college or just out of college. So uh, that's all I have for now. Thanks for dropping by, everybody.